Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading some History Magazine articles. This first article we're going to read is about Pauline Bonaparte, and this article was chosen by my channel member, Crystal. My channel members get to pick my History Magazine articles. And there is one coming up. I'm getting a new issue next week, which means next week I'll have a new members only video where they're going to pick magazine articles. So if you would like to be a part of that, you can click the join button right down there. Or if you're on mobile and it's not appearing, you can click the very first link inside the description box. It's only 99 US cents per month. And there's all kinds of other fun perks that you get. It's not just magazine articles. You get to watch all of my videos early, every single one. You get a shout out at the beginning of each video. There's all kinds of little perks. So, however, this is going to be an exception because last month my channel members picked a bunch of articles and I managed to fit them all into videos, but Pauline, this article didn't quite fit. And I'm like, I can't just do one video about this article about Pauline Bonaparte. So I did the rare thing where I did a poll in my community tab and asked you guys what other articles I should read. So this is just random articles that we're going to read. So the top two that you guys picked was the Battle of Thermopylae, that was the big winner. And then we're going to read about the Pirates of Port Royal and the tragedy that occurred there. So if you're interested in any of these topics, please stick around. But first we're going to read about Pauline, the best Bonaparte, let's be real. There were a lot of them, some were pretty terrible. Pauline was definitely the most interesting. Let's read about her. Pauline Bonaparte younger sister to Napoleon, was her brother's favorite of their seven siblings. She was the only one who took no part in his political power plays. While her siblings were placed on thrones all over Europe, Pauline was quoted as saying, I do not care for crowns. If I had wished for one, I should have had it, but I left that taste to my relations. Born in Ajaccio, Corsica on October 20th, 1780. She was the sixth of the eight children of lawyer Charles Marie Bonaparte and Maria Letizia Ramolin, Ramolino. Ramolin. Pauline opted for a life of amorous adventure rather than reshaping the political map of Europe. She used her beauty and boldness to conquer a long train of lovers and, despite scandals, won the admiration of the European Beaumont as an icon of style. Few women have savored more the pleasure of being beautiful, the French general Louis Stanislaus de Girardin wrote of her. For Napoleon himself, she was the best living creature, and the only one who never asks for anything. Though often frivolous and feckless, Pauline had a loyal and courageous side, too. She was the only one of his siblings to visit Napoleon and to help him financially when he was exiled to the island of Elba in 1814 after his failed military campaign in Russia. During his second banishment to St. Helena after his defeat at Waterloo, Pauline even requested to spend time with him on the remote island in the southern Atlantic. Family Fortunes Despite the death of her father when she was five, Pauline grew up in the bosom of a comfortable family until her early teens. And then in 1793, times got harder. Her brother Lucien became embroiled in a political controversy forcing the family to flee Corsica for the French mainland. Once in Marseille, they lived in straitened circumstances. That same year, Napoleon first made his name militarily, starting an ascent that would vastly improve his family's fortunes. Pauline never had the formal education that women of high social standing were expected to have to secure a wealthy husband. At age 15, her beauty was enough to catch the eye of her brother's military comrades. 
After a dalliance or two, she fell for the veteran French revolutionary Stanislas Ferron. Entangled with another mistress and 26 years Pauline senior, he was rejected by her mother. No end of suitors appeared. Napoleon told one aspirant, You have nothing. She has nothing. What does that total? Nothing. In the end, her brother persuaded her to consider Charles Leclerc. They married in 1797, and a year later, the couple's only son, Diomide, was born. Wife, widow, princess. In 1801, to quell an ongoing revolution in Saint-Domingue, in what is Haiti today, and protect France's sugar income from its colony, Napoleon, now first consul, sent Pauline's husband to the Caribbean, to lead 23,000 French soldiers. Pauline and her son followed in 1802. Leclerc achieved initial victories against the rebels, led by Toussaint Louverture. Leclerc's successes were short-lived. Renewed fighting coincided with an outbreak of yellow fever that began to decimate the French troops. Amid declining morale, Pauline provided social diversion with herself at the center, by hosting balls and fetes. She also turned the family's mansion into a field hospital. Leclerc urged his wife to return to France, but she refused. Leclerc wrote to Napoleon that she chose to follow her husband's fortunes for good or ill. In November 1802, Leclerc died from yellow fever, and Pauline and her son returned to France. While genuinely grieving for her husband's death, Pauline soon took up romantic liaisons. Her love life would always generate gossip, but it was frequently seized on and exaggerated by Napoleon's royalist enemies. Pauline was often singled out by Bourbon sympathizers as a nymphomaniac, who cared not whether her partner or partners were men or women, or when in Haiti with Leclerc, whether they were his officers or Haitians who opposed the French army, says Flora Frazier, author of Pauline Bonaparte, Venus of Empire. The object was always to damage, by extension, her brother's reputation. Napoleon had his sights set on imperial power and knew that his reputation must be beyond reproach. His sister's image was bound closely to his, and so, once again, he sought out a new husband for Pauline, very rich, well-connected Prince Camillo Borghese, whose presence in the family would help Napoleon reinforce ties with French-occupied Italy. They married in June 1803. Initially, Pauline approved of the 28-year-old prince's Mediterranean good looks, not to mention the title of princess, a generous annuity, property, and the use of the celebrated Borghese jewels. But Pauline soon grew disillusioned, and the marriage deteriorated. Among other jibes, she took to calling him his serene idiot. Pauline's health had begun to trouble her. In 1804, Prince Borghese took Pauline to the baths of Pisa to recover, but she didn't allow, but he didn't allow her to bring along her son. While she was away, the six-year-old contracted a fever and died. Pauline blamed the prince. Their ill-suited match now ruptured. She persuaded Napoleon to allow her to return to Paris rather than to Rome with Prince Borghese. Despising her husband, she once again took refuge in love affairs. Immortal beauty. Shortly after their marriage, Borghese had commissioned Antonio Canova, the greatest neoclassical sculptor of the time, to portray his new wife. The artist wanted a mythological theme, suggesting Diana, the Roman virgin goddess of hunting. Pauline laughed at such an incongruous idea, opting for Venus, the Roman goddess of love. Titled Venus Victrix, which is Venus Victorious, the resulting masterpiece has endured as Pauline's greatest claim to fame. By having herself depicted as Venus, Pauline's innate vanity could not be more evident. But, as Fraser notes, it also showed her disregard for convention, and even an enjoyment in breaking with convention. The statue's up here. I'm wondering. It's so pretty. Very Venus-like. 
Pauline's decision to pose nude was notorious at the time for a woman of her station, but the sculpture's technical virtuosity won widespread admiration when it was completed in 1808. Seen at night by torchlight, as Canova recommended, the figure's smoothly polished marble seemed like real flesh. Today, Pauline's form continues to amaze visitors to the Galleria Borghese in Rome. Napoleon seemed to ignore most of Pauline's un unconventional behavior. This choice contrasts with the man who, when named Emperor of France in 1804, emphasized good morals and restricted the rights women had gained during the French Revolution. For Napoleon, empire was one thing and family another, and no one exemplified that contrast more than his sister. Loyal to the last. Pauline's health problems worsened over the years. She experienced chronic abdominal pain and traveled from spa to spa in search of relief or a cure. She often insisted on being carried in a leader to avoid walking. Her demands became increasingly capricious. She bid her attendants to act as footstools or to lay down their cloaks on the ground so she could rest. When Napoleon was forced into exile on St. Helena in 1815, Pauline returned to Rome, where she lobbied the British authorities to set her brother free. Five years later, as reports came of Napoleon's decline, she repeatedly asked for permission to join him and be there when he breathes his last. He died in 1821, when she was still awaiting a response. Her own health was gradually broken by what is believed to be stomach cancer. In 1825, 20 years after separating from her husband, Pauline returned to live with him in Palazzo Borghese. It was there that she died three months later. What a life, right? A beautiful tiara here. Yeah. It's very, like, Romanesque um, by Napoleon's official jewelry. This is her house in Rome. And there she is. It's this hilt. Camilla Borghese's sword. Wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> but what do you expect from a Borghese hilt? Let's move on to very ancient history, going way back to the Battle of Thermopylae, which, if you don't know, is what the movie 300 is based on. Very epic movie. And really accurate, too, surprisingly. Every cat I've had is named after a movie character, and I've always wanted, probably my next cat's would be a little orange cat named Leonidas. So combine movie and history, right? But here we go. In early June of 480 BCE, a mighty Persian army crossed the Dardanelles Strait on two pontoon bridges to continue a brutal advance into Greece. Led by the great king Xerxes, the troops were bound for Thermopylae, a narrow mountain pass named for the area's hot sulfur springs, since Thermopylae means hot gates. Seated on the east coast of Greece, between the Malian Gulf and the Caledromal Massif, some 85 miles northwest of Athens, it is a rugged, craggy landscape of thick brush, thorny shrubs, and steep hillsides, where severe weather, torrential downpours, and scorching heat is the norm. The dramatically inhospitable four-mile-long pass, the quickest and easiest way to advance from the plains of Thessaly into central Greece, would soon be the site of a legendary battle, an epic three-day episode that has been memorialized in literature and history as an iconic example of heroic resistance against insurmountable odds. Facts and Figures much of what is known about the Battle of Thermopylae, and about the Greco-Persian Wars generally, comes from the Greek historian Herodotus, who wrote in the 5th century BCE. Other sources include the Sicilian historian Diodorus Siculus, whose 1st century BCE account is based in part on the earlier Greek historian Ephorus, the ancient Greeks Plutarch, and Tessius of Sinaitis, the modern historian George Beardo Grundy, who performed a topographical survey of the narrow pass at Thermopylae, 
and to lesser extent the Greek tragedian Aeschylus. No Persian account of the battle has survived. Many statistics related to the epic battle, however, remain hazy. The number of troops under Xerxes' command, for instance, is the subject of endless debate. According to Herodotus, the Persian king's military personnel numbered 2.6 million in all. His contemporary Simonides, 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 anyway, a poet, put the number at 4 million. Theseus, meanwhile, counted 800,000, while modern scholarly estimates, based on the Persians' logistical capabilities and constraints during that era, fall between 120,000 and 300,000. One thing most sources agree on is that the battle was born of both vengeance and ambition. Darius, the father of Xerxes, had been defeated by the Greeks on the plain of Marathon, near Athens, a decade prior, a battle that had conclusively ended the first Persian invasion of Greece. Ten years later, Xerxes was bent on getting even, and ultimately ahead by subjugating all of Greece, and thereby expanding the Persian Empire westward. Xerxes attacks. Standing in his way in the summer of 480 BCE was a rare confederate alliance of normally fractious Greek city-states, some of which were forced to suspend war with each other in order to face the greater threat from Persia. Athens, which had supported Greek cities in the Ionian Revolt, and later defeated Darius in 490, led the coalition with Sparta. The Athenian politician and general Themistocles led the Greek naval opposition, blocking the Persian fleet at the Strait of Artemisium. Leonidas, king of Sparta, commanded the ground forces at Thermopylae. 300 members of his royal Spartan bodyguard, called the Hippias, the subjects of countless books, movies, poems, and songs, along with a lesser celebrated contingent of 7,000 soldiers in all, including 1,000 Phocians, 700 Thespians, and 400 Thebans. Leonidas, age about 60, had ascended the throne around 490 BCE, after the previous king, his half-brother Cle Cleomenes, died heirless. The 300 Spartans with him were an elite cadre whom Leonidas had chosen personally. He wanted only soldiers with descendants to accompany him, since he knew there was little chance of them surviving, and wanted to be sure that their lineages would continue. Plutarch wrote that when the king was asked before the battle, what, Leonidas, do you come to fight so great a number with so few? He replied laconically, I have enough since they are to be killed. Xerxes' forces had advanced with ease through the region of Thrace, Macedonia, and Thessaly, where the overawed inhabitants surrendered without fight. When Xerxes arrived at Thermopylae in mid-August, he met a stern resistance that was ready for him. Best laid plans. Leonidas' plan was to hold Xerxes at the narrow pass, advantageous terrain that would act as a force multiplier for an army of inferior size. Restricted by the narrow gorge, the Persians would be unable to capitalize on their superior troop numbers or to use their cavalry. Meanwhile, the Greek fleet would concentrate on defeating the Persian forces in the strait north of the island of Euboea, which lay close by. That was the plan, but when Leonidas arrived at Thermopylae, he was perturbed to discover that a mountain trail, the Anopia Path, could allow the invaders to circumvent his position. It was too late to change the strategy, however. The fleet was already in position. Leonidas charged the thousand Phocians with guarding the path, while his men repaired a wall that protected an opening in the middle of the pass. Xerxes set up camp near Thermopylae, and bided his time for four days. He was convinced that the Greeks, upon seeing his mighty army, would be overcome with fear and retreat. According to Plutarch, he sent a messenger to Leonidas, urging him to lay down his arms, but the Spartan king, according to Plutarch, replied, Molon Rabe, 
come and take them. On the fifth day, the Persian attack began. Their advantage in numbers was of no benefit in this tight space, as Leonidas had anticipated. While they had an absolute abun sorry, while they had an abundance of courage and stamina, they were poorly trained for this terrain and lacked heavy weaponry. Their swords were shorter than those of the Greeks, and their shields were smaller. Their bows and arrows also proved useless against the Greeks' stout shields. The tight space suited the Greeks who were used to fighting in a phalanx formation, shoulder to shoulder, presenting a wall of shields to the enemy. It was an opportunity for the Spartans in particular to demonstrate their fighting capacity, the fruits of a life given over, body and soul, to the military. Betrayed. The Greeks pushed back Xerxes' men time after time, and Persian casualties mounted. Before the first day was over, Xerxes had assembled his best troops, an elite group of 10,000 men under the command of the Persian nobleman Hydarnes. The Greeks dubbed them the Immortals, because they seemed able to replace casualties immediately, so their ranks were never depleted. But even they couldn't subdue the Greeks, and were soon forced to retreat. Xerxes, watching the battle from a golden throne in the foothills nearby, is said to have jumped from his seat on several occasions, filled with rage at his troops' failure. The next day, the Persians attacked and were again unsuccessful. That is when a local Greek shepherd named Ephialtes, whose name has since become synonymous with treachery, handed them the secret to victory. Ephialtes told Xerxes about the Anapaya path, which led around the mountain ridge and ended behind the Greek positions beside the eastern end of the pass. In exchange for a handsome reward, he promised to show the Persian soldiers the way. According to Herodotus, Xerxes entrusted the advance to Hydarnes and his immortals, who set out from the Persian camp about the hour when the lamps are lit and marched all night up the trail. Dawn was breaking the next day when they reached the highest point and came upon the Greek troops standing guard. The Persians attacked with their arrows and forced the Greeks to retreat to the steepest peaks. Hydarnes didn't bother to pursue them. Wasting no time, he continued his advance along the Anopaia path. When Leonidas learned that the Persians had his forces surrounded, he called a council of war. Should the Greeks retreat or stand their ground? Despite the impossibility of their position, Leonidas was firm in his decision. His three hundred Spartans, along with a band of Thebans, would stay and fight. His sense of honor and strict military discipline made surrender unthinkable. For a Spartan like Leonidas, there were only two options, win or die. Herodotus adds another detail to the decision. The Oracle of Delphi had foretold that either Sparta would be destroyed by the Persians or its king would die. Knowing this, Leonidas may have believed that his sacrifice would save his city-state. Death of a Leader, Birth of a Legend Leonidas ordered the Greek fleet in the Strait of Artemisium to abandon its position and ordered most of the men fighting with him on land to leave the battlefield. Those who remained ate to gather strength. According to Diodorus Siculus, Leonidas said with grim humor, Have a hearty breakfast, for tonight we dine in Hades. He probably didn't say it like Gerard Butler. But... Ephorus and Diodorus Siculus recount how Leonidas then made an audacious early assault on the Persian camp. Herodotus' account, however, describes a Persian offensive. Xerxes didn't rush to attack as Hydarnes needed time to complete his preparations. The general poured out libations to the rising sun, which was revered by the Persians, and then waited until mid-morning to launch the Persian assault. Leonidas left the protection of the narrow gorge and took up position in an open area. While dangerously exposed, he was better placed to deploy his men and kill the greatest number of enemies. 
the Greeks, knowing that death was the only possible outcome, fought in a heedless frenzy. When their spears were broken, they drew their swords and continued to fight. Finally, Leonidas fell. A skirmish broke out around him. The Spartans attacked the Persians and managed to hold them at bay and recover the body of their king. When the defenders saw that Hydarnes had arrived with the immortals, they fell back and regrouped on higher ground behind the protective wall. Those who still had swords defended themselves. Others fought with fists and teeth. The Persians eventually broke down the wall and surrounded them, but avoided hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Instead, they finished off their enemies with arrows. By order of Xerxes, the Theban Greeks who had survived were branded on their foreheads, marked as slaves. Herodotus recounts that Leonidas' head was cut off and his body impaled. He was buried in Thermopylae, along with the other soldiers. A stone funerary monument in the shape of a lion was later erected, and the poet Simonides wrote a simple epitaph to all the fallen. Go tell the Spartans, thou that passest by, that here obedient to their words we lie. In 440 BCE, the bones of Leonidas were transferred to Sparta. His tomb there can be seen near the modern city of Sparta today. After Thermopylae, the Greeks went on to achieve great victories at Salamis and Plataea, where they decisively defeated the Persians. Leonidas and his men had reinforced the prestige of Sparta and raised the morale of all Greeks to continue fighting against Persia. As Diodorus Siculus wrote, these men, therefore, alone of all of whom history records, have in defeat been accorded the greater fame than all others who have won the fairest victories. Let's take a look at some of the pictures. This last one back here depicts a soldier, his name was Aristod Aristodemus, who was sent home because he was sick and he was shunned by all the Spartans because he left the battle. He was the one, like, survivor. But then it says he died in the Battle of Plataea to kind of redeem himself, right? There's the Battle of Plataea depicted down here. Here's a beautiful, looks like an oil painting of the battle. You can see the big cliffs here. And this is just a shield here with a, a Greek soldier fighting a Persian soldier. This is at the site of the battle today, this big statue of the Leonidas, the Spartan king. Here's another depiction of, here's Leonidas telling his troops to night be done. And here's the immortals. This is in Persepolis. Along one of the staircases, the immortals are uh, immortalized. Here's a map of the area, the Thermopylae Pass. We've got the path up here, goes all the way back around. And this is where they all fell, I believe. Let's see. Or maybe it's, I'm not sure. But that's where the battle took place. There's a gold coin depicting Xerxes. This is probably Xerxes. And there's another statue here of Leonidas and his Arabs. <laughs> and this is um, Persepolis, what it looks like today, the capital of the Persian Empire, the ceremonial capital. And there's a map of everything here. We have Thermopylae took place there. There's Cape Artemisium and Plataea and Salamis. So they came here from Asia Minor, right? Of the Persian Empire, now Turkey. Up there to attack. And were defeated. And another really beautiful painting here of the battle. But let's move on to our last article. Let's talk about some pirates. Pirate Haven of Port Royal, the wickedest harbor.
the 19th century author Howard Pyle is responsible for a great many beliefs about 17th century pirates, from their flamboyant costumes to their buried treasures. Published after his death, the 1921 Howard Pyle's Book of Pirates contains vivid illustrations alongside rollicking stories of life on the high seas. Historians have dismissed much of it as romanticized exaggeration, but his depiction of Port Royal still rings true. The town of Port Royal in the year 1665 came all the pirates and buccaneers, and men shouted and swore and gambled and poured out money like water then maybe wound up their merrymaking by dying of fever. Everywhere you might behold a multitude of painted women and pirates, gaudy with red scarves and gold braid and all sorts of odds and ends of foolish finery, all fighting and gambling and bartering for that ill-gotten treasure of the barabbed Spaniard. The English captured Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655. They noticed the port's strategic potential at the entrance to Kingston Harbor, and set about strengthening its defenses. Bristling with fortifications, the harbor was expanded to accommodate ships. Traders flocked to the protected haven. But in addition to legitimate trade, the port's prosperity also derived from less salubrious endeavors, piracy. During the mid-17th century, England and Spain fought a primarily naval war that frequently targeted the others' as shipping lanes. The plan was simple. The English crown gave license for pirates to attack Spanish shipments on sea and on land. Pirates became known as buccaneers, or the more dignified-sounding privateers, in a form of state-sanctioned piracy. Port Royal's position at the heart of the Caribbean, surrounded by the Spanish Main, put it in striking distance of the main shipping routes between the New World and Europe, making it the buccaneering capital of the world. Welsh pirate Henry Morgan used the town as his base and launched his attacks against Spanish cities, including Puerto Principe, which is today Camagüey, Cuba, Puerto Bello, which is in Panama, Maracaibo, which is now in Venezuela, and Panama City. His successful campaigns against the Spanish earned him a knighthood and political power in Jamaica, where he served as governor and lieutenant governor. Morgan would die a rich man in 1688. His body was interred in a lead coffin in the Palisadois Cemetery in Jamaica. Port Royal's attitudes toward piracy shifted with the political tides. When England and Spain were at odds, piracy was lauded, but crackdowns did occur. During one such time in the 1670s, somewhat hypocritically supported by Henry Morgan, those charged formally with piracy were executed on Gallows Point in Port Royal. Judgment the wealth accrued from legitimate trade and by pirates like Morgan turned Port Royal into one of the richest ports in the Caribbean, with brick houses of two to four stories, piped water, and innumerable brothels, gambling dens, and taverns. The Catholic Church condemned it as the wickedest town in Christendom, for its state-sanctioned pirates and tolerance of human vice. On the morning of June 7, 1692, the church rector of Port Royal, Jamaica, was running late for a lunch appointment, but a friend entreated him to delay just a while longer. It was a small choice that saved his life. The grounds began to roll and rumble, but the friend waved off the rector's alarm. Earthquakes on the island usually passed quickly, but this quaking only increased in intensity and the two men soon heard the church tower collapse into rubble. The rector sprinted outside, racing for open ground. By his description, the land split open, swallowing crowds of people and homes in one gulp, and then ceiling closed. The sky darkened to red, mountains crumbled in the distance, and geysers of water exploded from the seams ripped in the earth. He turned to see a great wall of seawater swelling high above the town. 
In a letter describing the disaster, the shock director wrote, In the space of three minutes, Port Royal, the fairest town in all the English plantations, the best emporium and mart in this part of the world, exceeding in its riches, plentiful of all good things, was shaken and shattered to pieces. A tsunami followed the earthquake, which scientists believe measured 7.5 on the Richter scale, making it a major event. By the time the catastrophe had ended, most of Port Royal, including the cemetery where Henry Morgan was buried, lay beneath the watery depths. As many as 2,000 people were killed immediately, and thousands more died soon after. Due to its licentious reputation, Port Royal faced what to many people must have looked like Judgment Day. It certainly felt that way to the church rector. In letters, he confessed that he longed to escape the scene of the disaster, but his conscience drove him to stay, venturing into the town day after day to pray with survivors in a tent pitched amid their flattened houses, which were looted nightly by lewd rogues. I hope by this terrible judgment, God will make them reform their lives, for there was not a more ungodly people on the face of the earth, he wrote. Submerged Sight Covered by silt and twenty to forty feet of murky water, the sunken town remained untouched for nearly three hundred years until marine archaeologists began to bring artifacts to the surface. These discoveries have helped reveal the truth behind the dastardly legends. One of the first explorations of Port Royal took place in 1956, when amateur archaeologist Edwin Link and his wife and research partner Marion visited the location. They pulled up a cannon from the fort, but concluded that more specialized equipment would be needed to plumb the muddy bottom and the artifacts within it. They returned in 1959 with the Sea Diver, an innovative vessel that Edwin had designed himself for underwater exploration. Over the course of a 10-week expedition sponsored by the National Geographic Society, the Smithsonian Institution, and the government of Jamaica, the Lynx's crew, along with elite U.S. Navy divers, recovered hundreds of relics. By applying high-pressure water jets against the bricks, then sucking up debris and silts with an airlift, the salvers uncovered walls of brick and mortar. Once uncovered, breakable objects were brought to the surface by hand. In the harbor's clouded waters, visibility was limited for divers, who could barely see a hand held before their faces. They often resorted to working by touch alone, groping in the ooze. One diver explained his experience of working blind. I guess you develop a sixth sense once you've been down there a while. You get so engrossed in what you may find there that you forget everything else. You lose sense of time. You even forget to wonder if there are sharks near you. But the dangers are very real. Sea urchins, stingrays, moray eels, and scorpion fish lurked, mostly unseen on the muddy bottom. There was also constant danger of cave-ins, as a dredge sucked at the base of the old brick walls. What the team found in the sunken pirate capital was akin to an underwater Pompeii. Marion Clayton Link described what originally attracted her and her husband to the site. Unlike cities on land, which change with the years, this one remained exactly as it had been more than two and a half centuries before, sealed by the seas in an instant earthquake. Whatever we might find in the ruins would be truly indicative of the time. Researchers used the term catastrophic sites for such places where a sudden disaster has preserved important artifacts and the context of life around them. From pewter tableware to Chinese porcelain, there were many signs of personal wealth. There was also numerous domestic objects denoting life in an ordinary household, such as spoons and lanterns, as well as elegant items like a wrought iron swivel gun. A truly astounding number of bottles and pipes were found, 
which gave the impression that people in Old Port Royal did spend most of their time drinking and smoking. Edwin even inserted a hypodermic needle into the cork of a bottle and withdrew a sample of yellow fluid for a taste test. Horrible. Taste like strongly salted vinegar, he sputtered. I guess 1692 must have been a bad vintage year. The most fascinating discovery was probably an elegant brass watch. Manufactured in Amsterdam in 1686, it had stopped at what was considered the exact time of the earthquake, 17 minutes to noon. These early explorations of Port Royal laid the foundation for more work. Starting in 1981, Texas A&M University led a 10-year excavation with the Institute of Nautical Archaeology and the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. Because of the oxygen-depleted environment under the water, the team recovered many organic artifacts that might have otherwise deteriorated. These finds have created an even more vibrant picture of what life was like in the Caribbean's most notorious pirate port in the 17th century. Let's look at the pictures before we go. This last one over here has some pirate artifacts here, some weapons, a bottle, and here's some famous books, Spanish coin, pretty vase. And here are some famous pirates. We've got Charles Vane, Calico Jack, and of course, the notorious Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. Here they are getting a sample of the drink. Apparently it was nasty, which I don't know. Do you think it was gross because that's how it used to taste? Or do you think it's gross because it just like deteriorated under the water? I don't know. Probably both. Pieces of the watch here, taken apart. Really pretty painting here of pirates attacking this big Spanish galleon. There's a old candle and an old candlestick down here. So here's an interesting map. Port Royal City beneath the sea. So this line here is the coastline before the earthquake. So you can see this whole shipping area was under the water. This whole fort went under the water. This whole market area, Fisher's Row, right? All the wharves. And then after the earthquake, this was the coastline. So here we can see the markets over here, the King's Yard, uh, goldsmith shop. And this was the shoreline by 1960 when they started excavating. So it had receded a lot, so there were some artifacts on land from the looks of it, but this is all the things that they excavated. And there's even some notes about what's been found, like clay pipes, brass watch and onion bottles, bars, things like that. Here's a newspaper article about earthquake at Port Royal in Jamaica. This is Henry Morgan, Captain Morgan himself, as in the, it's rum, right? I don't drink at all, so I don't know. It's rum, right, Captain Morgan? There's a syringe here used to treat ailments, it says. Really pretty map here of Port Royal. You can see the city is right here. This would have been the coastline that got swallowed up, right? All the port areas. And here's what it looks like today. How fascinating. And then there's a little tankard, I guess it's called. <laughs> Drink beer out of that, right? I wouldn't know. And then this picture here of um, pirates taking these captives and a treasure box. <laughs> but that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And again, if you want to be a part of the History Magazine videos and pick which articles I read, 
can click the join button right down there or the first link in the description box. I hope that you found this video to be relaxing and educational and I hope that you have a good